I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about amantadine for ADHD. Take home message is that amantadine is an agent that's been used widely for at least 50 years for Parkinson's disease. It's used in Parkinson's because it was randomly or promoted as a dopamine releasing, increasing dopamine availability agent. It's in the third tier choice of drugs for treating ADHD. So stimulants being the first tier, non-stimulants that are FDA approved, such as Intunib, which is guanfacine, and adamoxetine stratera being the second tier, and then other agents are sort of lumped as a third tier. Four or five studies that have been done, all of them are in children with ADHD, all of them suggesting positive effects. And it's encouraging because it seems to help with a range of impulsivity, focus, and aggression. So a pretty broad range of ADHD symptomatology and fairly mild, low side effect profile, particularly compared to the stimulants and some of the other non-stimulant options. So the take home is that for many people, it may be a reasonable agent to try, although right now it's not at the first tier. Actually approved amantadine first for treating influenza A. This is a drug that showed up first as an antiviral medication. It was a good treatment in the early days in the 60s for treating what was called Asian flu or varieties of influenza A. In the current era, it is not recommended for the treatment of influenza A because so many strains seem to have developed tolerance to it. So this drug was being used by a woman for treating her influenza infection, and she noted that it helped markedly with her Parkinson's symptoms and told her doctor, who was astute enough to, good enough to listen carefully to her and follow up on it. With a little more research, in 1973, the U.S. FDA approved amantadine for treating Parkinson's disease. For Parkinson's, we know decreases bradykinesia, which is the slow movements of Parkinson's, it decreases the rigidity, which is another hallmark of Parkinson's, and it decreases tremor symptoms, resting tremors. Usually it is not the first tier agent in Parkinson's, usually L-DOPA is, and it's very frequently combined with L-DOPA. Also being used with increasing frequency for a couple other conditions. One is for traumatic brain injury, as well as neurodegenerative diseases, including dementia experimentally for treating fatigue and multiple sclerosis. And it's being fairly widely used, particularly in pediatric mental health clinics for treating ADHD. Although again, there's actually very little that's actually been published. When I was in medical school and, and training, the clemosomantipine was just a drug that boosted dopamine release, boosted dopamine levels. They'd have some dopamine reuptake. And that's why it was a good match for Parkinson's. It's still often listed in many neurology and old psychiatry textbooks or pamphlets as a dopamine boosting drug. Late 80s, early 90s, much of the 90s, there was emphasis on how amantadine affects the NMDA, which is one of the glutamate, glutamate the most common cytotory neurotransmitter in the brain and that this was an NMDA receptor blocker. Prominent one is memantine. Memantine is actually chemically a derivative of amantadine. Memantine, though, actually does seem to be genuinely a good, robust NMDA glutamate receptor blocker. And although there was lots of papers you can still read that push that the major action of amantadine is an NMDA receptor blockade, more recent studies, yes, there is some action on NDA receptors blocking them, but it appears you need considerably higher concentrations than are generally achieved with therapeutic levels. And the amantadine has several other neurochemical actions that are considerably more potent than its NMDA blockade action. So it's not that NMDA may have nothing to do with it. Blocking glutamate receptors is one way of boosting dopamine within the brain. Amantadine needs to be transported across the blood-brain barrier from the blood into the cerebrospinal fluid. Levels in cerebrospinal fluid tend to be slightly lower than blood levels, not hugely lower. In-brain cells are considerably higher than CSF or plasma levels because amantadine gets transported into cells 
and then it gets protonated, and then the positive charge on it makes it harder for it to seep back out. Given that within cellular concentrations may be 10 times higher than circulating blood levels, it still seems that it's likely only having mild or weak effects on that NMDA blocker. So what else is it doing? One is it interacts with the aromatic L amino acid decar- decarboxylase enzyme, that's AAAD. So that's an enzyme that's important for the existence and levels of a number of neurotransmitters. It binds something called sigma-1 receptors, and this is a system that has not been studied for a long time. So we don't understand fully what best native endogenous receptors for sigma receptors are, but we know that if you bind to sigma re- one receptors like amantadine does, one that boosts tyrosine hydroxylase activity. Tyrosine hydroxylase is one of the enzymes that's immediately precursor to making dopamine in the brain. So boosting that boosts synthesis of dopamine. We know that sigma one receptor action modulates those NMDA blockers that are stimulating dopamine release. So another way to help boost dopamine release. We also know that binding the sigma-1 receptors increases dopamine in living animals, including humans, in the striatum, decreases dopamine reuptake, so more is left to be available, and actually boosting those sigma-1 receptors increases synaptogenesis and inhibits inflammation. That's probably more important for its help with those neurodegenerative diseases, boosts what's called glial cell-derived neurotrophic factor, produced by glial cells to support cells of the brain that decreases inflammation and increases nerve cell growth and connectivity. We also know that amantadine boosts certain phosphodiesterases, and these are enzymes that increase intracellular brain cell cyclic AMP and have anti-inflammatory effects. And actually, amantadine is a stronger blocker of certain nicotine receptors, and it has an effect on NMDA receptors. That's a little bit strange because actually boosting nicotine receptors seems to be beneficial for ADHD. So the relevance of the nicotine receptor action is not clear at all. Lots of potential actions for how amantadine is working, and we don't know either for Parkinson's or ADHD or some of the others, which of those actions may be most important, which are irrelevant. So in 1980, there was a pilot study. It involved just nine kids who were all between the ages of 10 to 13. They took 100 milligrams of amantadine twice a day. They stopped stimulants. There seemed to be some substantial benefit for what we call now ADHD symptoms. In 1980, they were defined as hyperactive children, but the conclusion of that study is that it was encouraging that there did seem to be really some effect. Some kids seemed to do as well on the amantadine as they did on the stimulant. Another tiny study, 2001, only eight kids, and these kids had ADHD and other significant developmental delays or disabilities mark impulse control and behavioral issues, but four of the eight kids responded markedly improvement with the mantidine. Then in sort of the more modern era, in 2007, there's a study out of Italy by Dr. Don Francesco. It was an open-label study. People knew what they were getting, and the doctors knew they were treating these kids. 24 kids were treated with clearly defined ADHD, and both teachers and parents rated how the kids responded. They were dosed up to 150 milligrams of amantadine a day. 58% of the parents thought their kids responded to the amantadine, and almost 50%, 46% of teachers saw that there was an improvement on amantadine. And the magnitude of the effect described by the investigators, they felt it was a substantial, bigger than placebo effect, but smaller than a stimulant effect. The next study was the first head-to-head comparison and blind study, so conducted by Mohammadi in Iran in 2010. And they looked at 40 kids. They were on amantadine for six weeks, either doses of 100 or 150 milligrams a day, or they were on a dose of Ritalin methylphenidate that was either 20 or 30 milligrams again. 
determined by body weight. The success of the study or the rating was both parent and teacher ADHD rating scales. And what they found is that there was absolutely no difference between the amantadine group and the Ritalin group. They both showed a substantial and steady decline over the six-week course of the study. There were more problems with decreased appetite and restlessness with Ritalin and all the studies so far mentioned, the amantadine was fairly well tolerated. Finally, in 2021, Morrow at Baylor University in Texas published a more substantial study. They looked at 291 kids, 251 of those who did have diagnosed, early diagnosed ADHD. Um, again, an open sort of a chart review study where they looked at all the kids who were on amantadine and saw what diagnoses I had and how they responded. So it's retrospectively looking at them. Again, people knew what they were taking. Their doctors knew what they were taking. Half of these kids, 48%, were also on a stimulant while they were on the amantadine. The median dose, so that's the average dose in this study, and these are all kids, was 200 milligrams. So it's substantially higher than the previous studies. And the range was from 50 to 400 milligrams, 64, 65% of the kids on the amantadine had what was determined to be a success, a good response to the amantadine. Another 20% had minimal, so slight response. And it was only 10, 11% that showed no response and stopped taking the amantadine because of that. And another 4% that had to stop because of side effects. I think few cases were headaches, restlessness, and some were decreased weight decreased appetite early on. That can happen with amantadine. Again, it's less likely than it is with stimulants. And most reports suggest that that's a short-term, usually not an ongoing problem. They actually looked what types of symptoms in these kids with ADHD responded to the amantadine. And 82% of them, impulsivity decreased while on amantadine. That was the best symptom cluster in terms of response. 52% decreased irritability or anger. 51%, so about half the kids also had an improvement in focus. 29% had a decrease in aggression or outbursts, whether how you define that is different from irritability or anger. I think this is more the behavioral manifestations. 21% had improvement on other thought processing, executive function, symptomatology. So again, a fairly broad range of ADHD symptomatology seems to respond of kids who started, these are not a formal study, but who were initially on atomoxetine or guanfacine. Almost half of those, 44%, either were able to completely stop that agent or reduce the dose substantially. On the other hand, only about one out of five people who were already taking stimulants when amantadine was added on, were able to stop or substantially reduce their stimulant. 87.5% of kids who had failed a previous trial of stimulants, 80% of them achieved treatment success or at least partial success when they tried amantadine. And even more impressively, but similar, 90% of those who had tried guanfacine or atomoxetine and had either gotten no response or had gotten side effects were able to achieve treatment success with amantadine. They didn't address side effects too systematically. Again, most people report pretty mild, even at this Baylor clinic where they're using substantially higher doses. Most people tolerated it well. Appetite suppression is one possible side effect, usually transient, short-lived. Very interestingly, in respect to some of our other studies and almost all the other drugs, being used for ADHD, no increases in blood pressure are systematically noted. In fact, some people have decreased blood pressure. That also would suggest that if it's having much of a norepinephrine increase effect, it's probably purely within the brain and not much in the peripheral nervous system. Some people have some mild gastrointestinal issues. Headaches have happened. One recommendation I saw in another paper that was promoting amantadine more broadly for ADHD suggested people should start slowly on 25 milligrams and ramp up. The only pill size it's being made in right now is 100 milligram size. For these studies, the formal studies, 
most of the time they started directly at a hundred. So that may be overly cautious, particularly for adults. Um, again, the Parkinson's and other literature where this is being used, traumatic brain injury, where people are, we tend to be cautious and go slowly because brain is clearly physically damaged or in Alzheimer's where it's degenerated. Seems to me reasonable and safe for most people could start at a hundred, see what that effect is like. Probably waiting several weeks before going to a higher level. Fairly consistent body of literature showing it's decreasing brain inflammation and probably boosting factors that increase nerve cell growth and synaptogenesis. None of those are indications that this is going to have a long-term detrimental effect on the brain. And many people with Parkinson's, Parkinson's tends not to kill people quickly. Many people with Parkinson's have their symptoms for a decade or more before they die. Many people have been on this drug for years and years at a time. So this is being fairly widely used in academic centers and probably from what we're seeing so far is reasonable to be trying more often in the child population. And given that everything we've looked at for kids with ADHD seems to have at least roughly comparable benefits in adults with ADHD, it certainly should be considered as an option there. I've only used it a handful of times, did not see much success. So personally, I haven't seen more. I'm happy if people write in and comment about what their results are or aren't. Stay healthy, stay happy. I will be back next week 